Everybody, I'm Tom Basso and welcome to Board Game Breakfast. It's good to have you with us today. I have two important things to start off the show with. First of all, uh, this show is sponsored by Ellsworth Games. Catacomb Cubes is a game that they have running on Kickstarter right now. I actually had a chance to see this game at Dice Tower Con, and it's a really interesting game because you're built. It's not like their original game, which was a dexterity style game, uh, flicking discs around. Here you are using different blocks and building them to form different buildings as you're building up a village, but there's actually some like 3D Tetris stuff going on. So check our link in the description here to, to go see that Kickstarter campaign, and we want to thank them for sponsoring this show. Also, and this is really, really important here. Dice Tower West registration opens up tomorrow, Tuesday, 6 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Dice Tower West, uh, which is our convention. We ran it for the first time last year, or this year actually, uh, and it's going to be amazing. It's in Las Vegas. It is just open gaming and a few events. It's like, you know, the other Dice Tower cons and it, we had such a blast last year this year the library is even better every week when you see the what did we add to the library this week all that stuff is gonna be at dice tower west we're working on the logistics of getting it out there so that's exciting so uh, i imagine it will sell out quickly it sold out last year in the first day so just in case be prepared be ready find out more information about it at dicetowerwest.com all right, well, that's all the intro stuff. Let's get started with our show. Here we go. So what did I find on the internet this week? Well, first of all, a really cool article at BoardGameAtlas.com about the two artists for Wingspan, um, how they were best friends in high school, then moved away, and how they worked together to do all the art. It's a really neat story. Check it out. So on Reddit, uh, someone posted a thread where they made an app that you can download for your game that keeps track of how long everyone's turn takes and then gives you the stats and information after the game. Now, be buyer beware in a sense because you may not like what you find out and some people table may not be comfortable with it. This sort of thing, though, fascinates me. I, I, this website's been out for a while, but if you've never seen it, sleeved.io, you go there, you type the name of your game in, and then it will tell you what sleeves you need. You can like pick the what kind of sleeves you want from different companies that make sleeves and it will tell you how many you need. Really useful site. Rick Loomis, uh, the owner and publisher of Flying Buffalo Games, has had, he's uh, been in the industry longer than most of you watching have been alive, has done a lot, and there is a GoFundMe. He's, he's very sick, so uh, you can check the link for that in the description. So the... Lead developer of Magic the Gathering posts an article about why diversity matters in their game design. I always find uh, Mark's articles to be very interesting. He, he writes a lot about a lot of interesting things. And so he talks about this uh, included diversity in the game and why they put it there. I also found that if you click the links below, someone took the Joan of Arc giant dragon, scanned it, and made a smaller version of it. Now, not to sell or anything. This isn't an illegal thing. They they bought the, the dragon, but they needed to make it smaller. And this sort of thing is fascinating to me. Like, how big is something that you can scan and make it smaller later on? I don't know. Uh, Hyperallergic.com has an article, Dazzling and Didactic Board Games from the 19th Century. You want to know what board games used to look like? Well, go read that article, and you'll be thankful for the innovation that we have now. Uh, a funny article from Beaverton.com. A new indie board game takes 105 hours to set up. <laughs> There's a few lines in there that made me laugh. And then Meeple People Comedy. This is a new series on YouTube that uh, is starting up with actual real actors and everything. It's like a bunch of very short clips, in a sense, uh, that bring out that awkwardness and humor from game night and maybe uncomfortable moments kind of like i felt like almost office style here's a clip i'll show it to you and then if you want to see more you can check out their channel 
Okay, hear me out on the oh, Chao Fa rule. Seriously. Here's what I'm saying, okay? I mean, think about it thematically. Chao Fa is the only road leading to the fish markets, right? If instead you took your tuk tuk. Put and that tuk tuk down. But I think that you're wrong about the rules. I'm gonna to count to 10. I've based One. my entire strategy around this. <laughs> It's your turn. Ooh. Hey guys, I'm ready. I'm Ellen. Welcome to We Game Together. On the menu tonight. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. That was uh, <laughs> intense. Um, okay. Readers of Midgard. What do we think? Was this our first purchase at Gen Con? Our first official pictures at Gen Con. Yes. And the person we were with suggested Black Angel, and we had already heard of Black Angel too. Yeah. Decided to get the Black Angel. We talked about Black Angel last week. I like that one a little bit better than this, but this one is still it's fantastic. It's so, I really love this. You know me. I think I've said this before uh, probably I know one you. million times. You know me. I do. That's awesome. Ellen we should get married. Kirby. Yes, Kirby. exactly. Kirby. Kirby. I love when it's somebody else's turn and you get to like reap benefits of somebody else's turn. Right. So like so when you place your not worker. not quite like that. Well, but when you but place yeah. your worker, mm -hmm. I have a choice um, to do something in the same place you went. Right. But without bonuses. Right. And I, I don't care. I like it. I'll take anything. No, that's get. cool. It's, so you're, get. you're taking an action, and whichever action you select, everybody else has the option of choosing that action mm -hmm. also, but at a diminishing bonus rate. Right. So with two players, most of them is. are a bonus and not a bonus. But like in when you do the three and four player side of the board, mm -hmm. the first player that goes there that's controlling the round, he gets the best benefit and it gets cycles down. The very best one. It's really um, Also, kind of obviously, thingy. you can see that it's beautiful. Yes. It's beautiful. And I people, think it played awesome at two, right? No, yeah, it's fantastic at two. It even has the entire opposite side of the board is a oh, two player board. Right. So it makes setup even easier in that too. So very clean, very straightforward. Mm -hmm. I liked it a lot. A lot of people are going to compare it to Champions of Midgard. It has some similar elements. Ellen, you haven't played I've that not played before. It, so I'm taking it's like a souped-up um, Lords of Waterdeep, especially once you put the expansions. It has it adds quite a bit more. But um, so you are going out on adventures. You have to roll some dice, so you'll see a lot of similarities there. Overall, it is a worker placement, so you always have that similarity. Mm -hmm. But they are different games. Or you could easily have both of these in your collection and. And have two unique. I have nothing game to add here, so this is interesting. Good. <laughs> I'm Good. so I'm enlightened. I'm, I'm so enlightened. enlightened. Everyone. Yeah, that's what's <laughs> happening here. <laughs> so fantastic game. Definitely recommended at two. We are playing it tonight at three, and I can't. I can't wait because I really want to see how uh, it's going to work with that diminishing. That I, thought you meant diminishing. I thought you meant three o'clock, and I was like, it's not three. So no, my husband's losing that. his mind, but I actually am the one who's losing my mind. Yeah. Okay, I can't wait to play it again. It's awesome. Check that out. Check this out. Check it out. But especially check this out. Yeah, really. Do it. See ya. This is Roy Canning, and this is Printed Pieces, where we talk about 3D printing and what it can bring to the board game hobby. Well, this Gaslands Refueled book came into the studio, and Tom was having me look at it, and I was like, oh man, let me see if there's some like guns or different things like that that I can get for the game um, and print out on the 3D printer. So I looked on Thingiverse, and there are tons of different like weapons and guns and templates and all sorts of different like terrain and stuff for Gaslands, which is really cool. So I printed out several um, of the guns. I just threw them all over the bed and printed them all out and I um, bought a bunch of Matchbox cars or Hot Wheels cars um, from the store and brought them in the studio and had everybody like pick out their own Hot Wheels car um, and then just gave them the super glue and a bunch of different stuff. So I wanted to show off some of how we took regular Hot Wheels cards and converted them into Gaslands cars, just 3D printing stuff. Um, it was pretty fun because some of us just like made the cars our own way. Like Sam's like, oh, I want to make this cool truck and like everybody's like gluing stuff and some people even found some other accessories to glue onto their cars as well. But yeah, definitely awesome stuff. So it's really cool that 3D printing, you can find stuff for all sorts of different games you play. Like this is like the cheapest miniatures game ever. And when you add 3D printing into that, it makes it really affordable because it's really inexpensive to for the filament for these tiny little guns and stuff like that. Also, here's Chris's car that he painted up and um, glued the 3D printed things on and then tried to make it look really good and post-apocalyptic there. So that's awesome. Well, awesome. Well, this has been Printed Pieces, looking at Gaslands and the cars that we made. Thanks so much for joining me, and I'll see you on the next one.
Look at all these awesome Gaslands cars. Wait, those aren't 3D printed pieces. What is this abomination? So what's gonna be from the Dice Tower this week? Well, I'm gonna be taking a look at Pipeline, Mr. Face, Mega City Oceana, QE, Wordsmith, King Me, Medium, Bargain Quest, and uh, the gerrymandering game, uh, Mapmaker. Uh, there, we're gonna be doing a Dice Tower dive on Monopoly. And of course, taking a look at the great game Reavers of Midgard. Testing Tuesday, a live board game breakfast on Thursday. Uh, we're gonna do a different kind of top 10 this week. We've been doing a lot of board games ones. We're gonna jump into pop culture, so you'll see that. Just We do these every once in a while, just as kind of a change of pace. And But lots of different reviews. Mandy and Suzanne's podcast will be going up to, uh, tomorrow on Tuesday. And you can find that at Dicetower.com. And, of course, all the other podcasts in the Dice Tower Network. So lots of things coming your way. We hope to see you there. Hello, we're Board Game Opinions. I'm Jonathan. I'm Steve. I'm Amy. I'm Mark. And this is our Speed Quiz, where our contestants are attempting to guess as many games as they can in a particular category. And this week's category is... Farming games. Any game with a farming theme. You can have anything in the top 1,000. There are 34 possibilities you could have. As usual, it's two points if I've not played it, or one point if I have. And we're going to start with Steve. Off you go. Agricola. Yes. Viticulture. Yep. Agricola, all creatures big and small. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Caverna. Yep. Harvest dice. No. Caverna, mm. cave versus cave. Yep. <laughs> Bonanza. Uh, yes. Yeah. Scoville. Yes. Uh, oh, I'm not oh, sure. We're we're not sure. Going. Feast for Odin. Uh, no. Ooh. Oh, okay. Um, have a little one there. Happy Pigs? No. Cottage Maybe. Garden? Yes. Oh. oh, so Spring Meadow? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> not high enough. Uh, I will open it up to the floor. Uh, Le- Lagrania. Uh, yes. Lagrania. Uh, Lagarha Siesta. No. No, oh, it's not either. No. Um, there's a bunch of Euros here. Oh, oh. there's a uh, Fields of Arl? Yes. Good. And Fields of Green. Yes. Oh my goodness, um, Steve's running right right away. The Euros, that's all I did. I've played them. <laughs> uh, oh my goods? It's not got any farming. Oh, no. Oh, oh um. Uh, oh, oh the boy? No. Not high enough, I think. Um, it might be farming. There's a bunch of other Euros here. Um, yeah, glass that. road? No. Can't think. And that's time! Let me count up scores and we'll see how they did. Okay, so Steve ran away with it this week with seven points, because uh, I haven't played Fields of Isle. Uh, Amy got two and Mark got three. Other things you could have had were Clans of Caledonia, um, Goa, Heaven and Ale, Madeira, Puerto Rico, they should have got oh, that one. Yeah. Santa Maria, Takenoko, Zolkin. Oh. Were there any that you got that they didn't? Thanks very much for watching. We will see you next time. Bye. Bye. Howdy, folks. Welcome to By the Numbers. My name is Hunter Thomason from the Family Showdown. On each episode of By the Numbers, we take a look at a board game in America related topic. This week's topic Cult of the New Revisited. I occasionally get suggestions from viewers for topics for my segment, but one Jacob Welch went above and beyond the Call of Duty. Look at all that amazing data. So what were we looking at? We were looking at the ratings of the top 100 games each year from 1990 to 2019. So let me explain. No, there's too much. Let me sum up. Looking at the summary, we see that the average rating of the games almost consistently increases every year from 1990 to 2019. Let's sum up our sum up, and we have a nice little trendy line, and we see that it trends almost perfectly, like up, up from 1990 down here somewhere, maybe over here, all the way up to 2019, way over here. So why is this happening? My first thought was that the older games would have fewer ratings which would drive down their average rating, their geek rating, because the fewer votes you have on Board Game Geek, they arbitrarily lower your rating. But, if you look closely at the data, we're not using the geek rating, we're using the average rating, which kind of throws that out the window to a certain extent, even though our top 100 is based on its geek rating and not its average rating. 
Or could it be that the games are just better? Is that the reason? Could there be another reason? I'll let you discover that on your own. See you next time. <laughs> All right, folks, let's see what games we're adding to the Dice Tower Convention Library this week. You're going to see these at the retreat soon. We have Santorini. This is the nice version of it uh, with a great two-player uh, game. Then we got Dead Panic and Munchkin Panic, both from Fireside Games. Uh, from Prospero Hall, we have The Wizard Always Wins. It's a, a really cute, fun little game. And then the, also from Prospero Hall, we have Bob Ross, The Arch of Chill, and Happy Little Accidents. That's two Bob Ross games in one. All right, now we got, uh, last week we showed a bunch of Tiny Epic stuff, but we also have Tiny Epic Defenders and Tiny Epic Quest going into the library. From Pandasaurus Games, we have Mental Blocks. From Quinted Games, we have, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, Riatia. Anyway, back to Tasty Mitchell Games, Gold West and Harbor. Great to have both those games in the library. A lot of people like this party game, Fun Employed, and I like to have party games in the library, so yay! For our kids' library, we have Voyola, Farm Rescue, and Bears! Yay for the kids' library. All right, Sam likes this one, and everyone likes the theme of Jaws. And we also have the opposite of Jaws, Bora Bora. That's actually not true, but hey, I need to fill up my felled part of the library. Cutthroat Caverns, and to make most of you happy, 1830. Yay, 1830 games in the library. From Amigo Games, the very brand new edition of Cafe International and Club. That's pretty good. From uh, CGE, we have Last Will, the expansion. Well, man, I sure hope we get the regular game. And Galaxy Trucker, as well as Galaxy Trucker, the big expansion. And Galaxy Trucker, another big expansion. Also from CGE, we have That's a Question and Pictomania. Do -do -do -do. Okay, let's continue on. From Artipia, we have Fields of Green. From Amigo, for the kids, we have Engine Engine number nine. We already have Stockpile Library, but we put the newest expansion I just reviewed last week in it. And then Brook City with some Kickstarter exclusive stuff and some expansions. Yay! All right, so for Matigo, we have Barony, River Dragons, and Room 25, as well as Princess Jing. That's a lot of cool games from Matigo, and we're not even done yet. Hey, Founding Fathers. I like having historical games in the library. And just like Founding Fathers, Telestrations, the great party game. And wait, there's more from Matigo. Another copy of Kemet, and another copy of Cyclades, because both of those are fantastic, and we need two copies of each. Then from Amiga, we have Heimwick and Company, and Saboteur of the Lost Mines, and Escape from the Hidden Castle, as well as, not from Amigo, but a very, very old uh, uh, copy of Acquire that probably no one will ever play. All right, from Plan B Games, we have the new Century Golem Edition Eastern Mountains, as well as Century Spice Rose, Century Eastern Wonders, and Century New World. I already have a copy of all of them put together. Now I have three different copies in three different boxes, so yay. From Amigo, Take 5, Cake Off, Fruit Punch Game, Deja Vu, and Clack. That's a lot of games from Amigo. That's exciting. Z just reviewed this one, Devere. And from Tasty Mitchell Games, we have Eminent Domain and all the expansions from Eminent Domain in one box. Also from Tasty Mitchell, we have another copy of Orleans because it's a great game. And Heist. Yay! Alrighty. Now let's take a look at some stuff from Eggertspiel. We're adding Mombasa, Heaven and Ale, and Coimbra. I'm adding the expansions for Tricarion, and a copy of Grimfars for our kids' library, because that's great. And then finally, Old West and Presario. That's all we're adding to the library this week. More coming next week. Pandemic! This one is a little bit different. It is set on a plane and is real-time cooperative. Chaotic? Yes. Fun? Yes. How does it play? Coming up. Hi, Stella from Middle University. I imagine most of you are familiar with pandemic games. There are many versions of it. Each mostly has slightly different mechanics than the others. I have played a few versions of Pandemic, including Season 1 the Legacy Game. I have Season 2 by sitting on the shelf at the moment. There are also real-time cooperative games already out there, such as Magic Maze, Kitchen Rush, and Escape the Curse of the Temple. All I like. Now, imagine them being mashed into one. We have Pandemic Rapid Response. Two to four players are working together 
trying to roll the right combinations of dice to get the right supplies on a plane and limit it by time. So you draw a few cards that tells you what city needs and what supplies. You got to move your plane and meet the demand. You got to make sure someone cleans the wastage area, otherwise everyone loses. The dice rolling is nice dose of luck, I think, for this light game. There are a few variants of event cards that come up usually, makes the game a bit harder. It feels chaotic, a little bit pressured, but fun. As with other pandemic games, you get to choose from different characters you play with, with slightly different power. There isn't a lot of time available before the team needs to gain all the required supplies. So you gotta do your turn really quick. And also because only you can roll your own dice, there might be less chance that this game is prone to an alpha gamer taking control of your game. Thanks for watching. We are Meeple University on YouTube. See you next time. Do you like to buy things that you don't want to get something you do want? Ah. Well, this starts all the way back when we were kids and you bought the cereal that you don't really care for because it was a cool prize inside or something you want inside. Advertisers know this. It definitely works. Do this to get this. How do you feel about that when it comes to board games? This week, I got a couple board games that I was playing through and I noticed that they had a card for another board game in them from the same company. Well, I guess that's fine, right? On initially, that's neat. Some extra content for this game. But what if I want that card... But I don't want to buy the board game to get it. So I'll find someone who likes that game and bought it. And then will give me that card to use in the game I like because they don't like my game. That's like the perfect situation. Or the perfect situation is, oh, I like both games, so it doesn't matter to me. And I get it, all right? I'm not a completionist. I don't need to have everything. But do you like when companies do that? I'm not sure I do. I remember very distinctly for Descent 2nd Edition, uh, they came out with Dungeon Quest the game, which is an awful game, right? But the characters in Dungeon Quest, they had cards where you could use them in Descent. And then I was like, well, I don't like Dungeon Quest, so I'm going to get rid of it. But I want to keep these characters for Descent. So I could take the character cards and the miniatures and put them in Descent, and then I have a not complete game I can't do anything with. Or I could just give the game to somebody else or sell the game to someone else, just keep the cards and use proxy miniatures, or I could just forget it. I don't really like that whole situation, hands down. Now again, I realize it's a first world problem, but I don't know that I like when companies do that. We talked about last week, you know, I used to buy Lunchables to get the overpower cards and or comic books that I didn't really want to get, but they had cards in them. And I think as overall, it's a good marketing move to say, hey, here's a chase item you want. I'm going to bundle it with this. You want it? You got to get them both. But at the same time, it's not, you know, the consumers don't really like it. But does it stop us? Maybe the completionists drive a lot of this stuff, right? They have to have everything. So they'll go hunt it down. How far are you willing to go? Would you buy a whole new game to get a little bit of content for your current game? I don't think most people would do that. Will you go try to hunt down those cards or things that are put in another game for your current game? I'm curious. Do you go out of your way to get them? Does it bother you that you can't? Do you not care about the whole thing at all? Let me know in the comments below. That's what I think. Good morning everybody, my name is Aaron from the Borgian Brothers. Welcome to another episode of Mystery Component Monday, a segment where I show you a picture of a mystery component and it's up to you to try to guess what game that piece comes from. So put on your thinking caps because here's this week's picture. Okay, time's up, pencils down, and thinking caps off. And the answer to this week's question is... Blood Rage. In Blood Rage, players take on the role of a clan of Vikings trying to take control of different areas of the board. The game is played over three rounds and players drop cards at the beginning of each round. These cards are used to upgrade your clan, increase your strength during battle, and accomplish quests. Players can also recruit monsters to help them in battle. 
Players figures who lose in battle are sent to Valhalla and return to their supply at the end of the round. But even if you won in battle, you have to beware, for Ragnarok can still destroy your army. Players have to manage their stats and balance when to attack, invade, enhance, or play quest cards in order to be the most efficient and dominant clan out of everyone. Blood Rage is an amazing game with beautifully detailed figures and fun, strategic, and enveloping gameplay that will entertain both hardcore gamers and casual gamers alike. And that's this week's game. Congratulations to everybody who got it right, and for everybody else, there's always next week. Until then, I hope you all have a happy breakfast. Well, that's it for another episode, folks. We will see you back here in a few hours for our live Q&A. Um, we got live stuff happening throughout this week. It's going to be a fantastic week. Don't forget Dice Tower West registration tomorrow. Once again, thanks to Ellsworth Games and Catacombs and Cubes for sponsoring this podcast. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. Thank you to all my contributors. You want to be a contributor for Di Board Game Breakfast? Email me at tom at dicetower.com. We'll see you all next time. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.